Hello, and welcome back to this analysis of the Bots A Documentary series. You guys really liked the first episode, and there was a high demand for a part 2. If you haven't seen the first part yet, click on this annotation to be taken there. This episode will be building on the mechanics that were discussed in the first part, so you might not understand everything if you don't watch from the beginning. Before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment to say at the time of writing this, the version of Bots A Documentary on Sin's channel has just reached 1 million views. This is a milestone that I never thought any one of my videos would reach, even if it isn't on my own channel. And for that, I thank everyone that allowed such a thing to happen, from Sin who shared it, to you, the viewers who watched it. But anyway, it's time to continue our journey. Bots A Sequel begins with a moderately long intro, making it unique in the series. The first map we visit is PLR Hightower. When you think about it, this is a slightly odd choice considering bots don't actually work on this map. Payload Race was released in 2009, and for some reason Valve never updated the TF2 bots to make them function in this game mode. Even though the regular payload was released just under a year before, yet the bots work fine there. As we discussed in part 1 of this series, the way bots work is that they have a main goal which they must complete. This is what makes them leave their spawn, where they then react to the world around them. In Payload Race, they were never given a main goal, and because of this, most of the bots just stay in spawn. I say most of the bots, because as we know, the engineers, snipers and spies do in fact leave their spawns. This allows us to understand that these classes don't use the same system that the rest of the classes do. Whereas the main goal for most of the classes is tied to the map, e.g. to push the cart in Payload, the goals for engineers, snipers and spies are more abstract. For example, spies and snipers are probably designed to just look for the enemy. Engineers, on the other hand, probably use a mixture of both systems. We know this because, on attack defend maps, they're programmed to set up at the point they're defending, yet they're clearly not defending a point here. This implies they have a backup plan, where if they don't know where to set up, they'll just set up at spawn. We will see more of this behaviour in the future. Probably the most notable event here is how the bots don't understand how to jump over the fence. To understand why they do this, we need to first understand how navigation meshes work. We covered navigation meshes briefly in the first part, but didn't go into detail. Now it's time to delve a little deeper and really have a look into how a nav mesh tells a bot where to go. If we open up an empty Hightower game in TF2, we can open up the console and enable cheats by setting SV cheats to 1. We can then type nav underscore edit 1 into the console. This will allow us to view the navigation mesh. It may look confusing at first, but once you get used to it, it's very simple. I'm sure the programming behind it is actually very complicated, but we don't need to go quite that deep for what we're doing. You'll notice that the map is separated into lots of squares and rectangles. These are the core building blocks of the nav mesh. Essentially, these dictate where the bots can go. Bots can move around anywhere within the borders of each shape. You may be wondering why the navigation mesh needs to be separated into so many smaller shapes. And the answer to that is that conditions can be applied to each square. For example, one section might have a no jumping condition that quite obviously will force the bots to stop jumping. You might also be wondering, if bots can only move around within the borders of a rectangle, then why are they not stuck in one section of the map? Well, if we zoom in, we can see that where two sections meet, there are light blue lines going from one square to the next. These are called connections, and they are what allow bots to know if it's okay for them to travel from one section to another. Connections come in two types. There are the light blue bi-directional connections we see here, and there are also dark blue one-way connections. One-way connections are typically used for ledges, where a bot can fall down but cannot get back up. So now we know about connections, we can begin to analyse our problem. As we can see here, According to the navigation mesh, there are two places the bots can get over the fence. We have a connection to a spot on top of the fence, and then a connection from that spot to the floor below. This should let the bots know where they need to go to traverse this obstacle. Let's spawn in a group of sniper bots to test this theory. It turns out our theory was incorrect. The snipers just walk into the wall like the engineers did in the original video. So what's our problem? Another look at the nav mesh makes it pretty obvious. The engine has made a glaring mistake when generating the mesh. What it's done is connected the raised platform with the surface below it without taking the fence into account. This clearly won't work as the bots just walk directly into the wall and if they manage to make it over, it will be due to a random jump. To a human, 
This mistake is obvious, but the Source engine doesn't seem to notice obvious mistakes. For example, the connection between the platforms is bi-directional, as we can tell from its light blue colour. However, the ledge is way too high for a bot to jump onto, and therefore the connection should be of the dark blue one-way variety. This problem is seen quite a few times around the map, such as here, where it's even right next to a one-way connection to the same area. So, how can we fix this? It's actually quite easy. If we highlight one of the surfaces, we can open the console and type in nav underscore mark. The selected surface will now be shown in white. Now we can hover over the surface it's connected to, open the console again and enter nav underscore disconnect. The two sections will no longer be connected, and the bots will no longer attempt to take this route. Let's spawn in the snipers again and see if it's worked. We've made progress. The bots are now going to the correct area, but they still aren't jumping. A quick look at the nav mesh lets us know why this is happening. There's another connection that doesn't take the fence into account, and this time it's one way. To get rid of this, we can just highlight the area, open the console and type nav underscore disconnect underscore outgoing underscore one ways. This will remove all outgoing one way connections, which is good for us as there is only one. Now we've removed this connection, I'll spawn the bots back in, and as you can see, they all manage to jump over the fence without any problems. In the next part of the video, we have the face-off between the two snipers. Not much happens here, but I thought it was interesting that the red sniper misses his shot, even though the blue sniper is pretty much standing completely still. It seems obvious, but when you're playing against bots, you don't really think about how they're programmed to miss as well as hit their targets. That pretty much covers everything in the high tower section, so let's move on. The next map is CP Degroot Keep. I knew from the start the bots would struggle on this map, due to them only being able to use melee weapons, but I didn't predict how dumb they could actually be. The first point of interest is the blue team's spy. I'm not entirely sure where the spy is trying to climb onto these barrels, especially as when we look at the nav mesh, we can see that there is no designated walkable section on top of them. It might be possible, however, that he's trying to reach a section of the map beyond the barrels, but there are no valid routes to get there. This happens often with bots. If all the routes to a location are blocked, they will just walk in a straight line, ignoring any obstacles in their path. This is what causes bots to get stuck in corners. As well as the spy, we can also see it happening with the sniper. All the exits are blocked, so he just walks into the wall. If we go forward to when the round begins, we see that some of the team members also run into the wall before leaving the spawn through the regular exit. At first, this appears strange, considering the gates are already open. But if we take a look at the nav mesh, we can see that the areas beneath the gates are marked with a blue outline. This indicates that the area is blocked and bots mustn't attempt to walk through it. When the gates open, the area stays blocked for a while, causing the bots to initially run into the wall. After a couple of seconds however, the blocked effect is removed and the bots stop ramming their faces into the wood and take the correct exits instead. The bots go on to cap one of the control points. They manage to do so without any problems and move on to the next control point. However, the team's engineer has frozen in place. In the first episode, we talked about how on attack to fend, attacking engineers will set up their sentry once they've capped the first control point, and that's exactly what's happening here. Unfortunately though for the engineer, only melee weapons are allowed on this map, and so he cannot place any buildings. The engineer bot has come to a point where his programming is telling him to place a building when it cannot, and it doesn't have any backup plan, so the bot just stands in place. Moving on, we have a sniper in a similar situation to the engineer. It's programmed to stay back and snipe from a distance, however, it cannot use its sniper rifle. The bot doesn't understand this though, and doesn't have any backup plans for this particular situation, so it continues to stay back. The video goes on to say how the red team's bots have become lost in their own castle. As we already know, there is no way out of the castle without jumping off the roof, so it's easy to assume the bots are just running in a straight line to the location they're trying to defend. However, if we look at the nav mesh, we can discover the true cause of the problem. The source engine has decided the best exit from the castle is through this window, and has put a one-way connection between the window and the ground below. Of course, we know players cannot enter and exit through this tiny hole, and bots are no different. However, that is where the nav mesh has decided they should go, and so they don't question it. Using the command nav underscore disconnect underscore outgoing underscore one ways, we can remove this connection, and the bots will stop trying to jump out the window, and instead run into the wall closest to the blue team. I've tried making connections from the roof to the ground below, 
But for some reason the bots refused to follow this, and continued to take the most direct route to the red team. Eventually, of course, the portcullis opens and the red bots are free to leave through the main exit. And exit the castle they do, because our blue engineer is confronted by a red pyro. In this scene, an engineer is attacked and walks off the cliff to escape. There are a couple of reasons why this might have happened. The first reason is, that the engineer bots knew he'd land on a ledge if he walked off the cliff at that position and used it to escape. The other possibility is that, when a bot's being attacked, they ignore the nav mesh. This might go both ways, and attacking bots will also ignore the nav mesh, which would explain why the pyro ran off the cliff when trying to kill the scout. But I'm hesitant to believe this theory, considering how the bots tend to treat the nav mesh as the ultimate guide to movement. You can remove the nav mesh around a control point, and even if there's just a tiny gap, the bots will refuse to cap it. I think, in this situation, it's a lot more likely the navigation mesh is faulty, and if we take a closer look, we can see that this square right here might be the cause of our dilemma. The area is half on and half off the rock, but the bot treats it all as a walkable surface, and so it falls to its death. The next few scenes are just repeats of earlier events, so let's fast forward a bit to this scene. Here we see the blue team and the red team trying to get through a closed gate. This is interesting, because if we look at an earlier scene with this gate, we can see that no bots are attempting to get through. Once again, if we look at the navigation mesh, at the beginning of a round the gate is treated just like the gates to the blue spawn, in that the nav mesh around it has been highlighted in blue and is marked as blocked. This is what prevents the bots from attempting to walk through it. Also just like the spawn gates, the blocks condition is removed when the gate opens. However, this is where the problems begin. When the gate closes again, the blocked condition is not reapplied, therefore the bots still think they can walk through this area. The last point of interest for this map is the blue pyro who wouldn't cap the final control point. I'm actually still trying to work out why this happened. I know earlier I mentioned editing the area around a control point so the bots won't cap it, but I honestly didn't change any of the navigation meshes on this map, or on any map for that matter. As always, with the things I can't explain, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. The next map we visit is CTF Twofold. Capture the Flag is a weird game mode for bots. They just don't seem to be able to understand how it works, and it kind of becomes just a deathmatch between the two teams. In this particular case, neither team has any engineers, and even if they did, they wouldn't be much use, as they don't understand that they need to build sentries in the intel room. In fact, they don't seem to build at all, which is strange, considering they'll build on Hightower, a map that the bots don't even work on. Anyway, there's not much to say about what the bots do on this map. It's pretty much just bots being bots. There are a couple of things that could be worth mentioning, such as how this spy swims, which could imply that spies don't walk or swim in a straight line to confuse the enemy. However, if we look at the nav mesh, we can see there is an abnormally large rectangle that isn't found at the opposite end of the water. And this rectangle just so happens to exactly mirror the path the spy takes in the video. This is a strange behaviour considering the area the spy ended up in was adjacent to the one he began in, but this kind of gives us an insight as to how bots treat each section of the nav mesh. I think the biggest point of interest in this map is how the bots consistently get stuck beneath these stairs. This is possibly going to be one of the hardest things to explain, but I have a vague idea of why it might happen. Then again, I might be completely wrong. Please take this point with a grain of salt. Whilst looking at the navigation meshes, you might have noticed these green and purple lines sticking up out of the ground. There's not much online about them, and they're not even mentioned in the navigation mesh page of the Valve Developer Wiki, but I believe they're to do with how bots handle corners. For example, I think a green line lets the bots know there's a sharp corner there. This allows the bots to avoid that area so they don't get stuck. Purple means the corner is more curved, and lets the bots know they can walk from point to point without getting stuck. I think the source engine has wrongly placed purple markers where there should be green ones. This means the bots will go from one marker to the other, thinking their path is clear, but in this case the path isn't clear. There are several boxes in the way, and I think this is what causes the bots to hesitate and become stuck. As I've already said, this might all be false information. There's hardly anything documented about these elusive lines and the only other person I spoke to who was even slightly knowledgeable on the subject pretty much said they didn't know either, and that they weren't important. If you know anything about these lines, even if it's just their name, please say so in the comments. Your insight would be greatly appreciated. Apart from those points, there isn't really much to talk about. 
Of course, we've got the fact that there's only one sniper, which goes back to the point that bots don't understand CTF. Anyone with 10 minutes in TF2 will understand that you need at least 5 snipers to win a round of Capture the Flag. Jokes aside, I feel bad for cutting the two fault sections short, so here's some trivia about the production of Bots Part 2. Originally, when Bots 2 and 3 were going to be one video, the two fault section was supposed to come after the double cross section. The idea was that the engineer was supposed to be mourning, and that's why he's not featured. But when I realised the video was going to be 40 minutes long, I split it into two parts. However, I felt the ending of the first part was lacking. I wanted a more emotional ending, so I swapped the two forts in double cross sections around, so that double cross came last, meaning the video would end with the death of the blue engineer. This, I felt, gave a much cleaner ending. I'm sure all of you enjoyed that very interesting behind the scenes of Bots a sequel, but now it's time to move on to our last map, which as I've just explained, is CTF Double Cross. It begins with the bots once again failing to jump over a fence. In a way, this is a callback to the first map of the video, and I'm not sure it needs to be explained again. What is worth mentioning is how all the bots eventually make it over the fence, except for the medic. All the bots seem to jump randomly, which allows them to pass, but for some reason, the medic refuses to do the same. I don't see why a medic bot's code would tell it not to jump, but looking at the evidence, it's possible that medic bots might actually be unable to perform this basic manoeuvre. This, however, is one of the least confusing things the bots did on this map. The next scene focuses on a jumping heavy, and I'm not even sure where to begin with this. It's possibly one of the strangest things I've seen a bot do. I've looked at the nav mesh, and I can't see anything out of the ordinary, so I'm stumped on this one. Moving on, we return to the engineer. I mentioned earlier that engineers are broken in Capture the Flag, and this engineer is a prime example of this. Here we see him just standing in spawn. When the bots stand in spawn, it usually means they're going to be stuck there for the whole game. However, in this case, the bot only stays in spawn for a bit before leaving. This is definitely a strange behaviour, as there is seemingly no reason for the bot to be standing in spawn if it can move without any problems. I also mentioned earlier that engineers won't build on CTF, and this is also demonstrated here. Usually when an engineer doesn't know where to build, they just build at spawn, which tends to act as a good failsafe, so I don't know why they don't follow this rule on capture the flag. It's probably for the best though, because I don't see bots handling a room full of sentries very well. But that's pretty much it for this episode of Bot and Analysis. The blue engineer runs to the red spawn, dies, and the rest of the video is just plot. As always, please like the video if you did, subscribe for more content, and of course, if you know anything about bots that I've missed, or you want to correct a point I made, please leave a comment down below. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. This meme will never die because we are in the beam.